All right. Um, that's everything I want to talk about on pain. So let's pick up the taste, and we'll talk a little bit about vision. Which is actually, both these are pretty interesting. Victory. Thanks. All right. So taste. Um, taste is also goes by another name. Um, taste is kind of the layman's term. Scientific term is gestation. Our unit of taste is going to be the taste bud. Okay, so here's a picture of a mouth with a tongue sticking out and then kind of a blown up chunk of tissue here showing the taste buds. And this arrow here, we'll get there. We'll get to a, a better look at the taste buds. So on the surface of the tongue, you can see we have these knobs and, and protrusions. Those protrusions are what are called papillae. And because it's part of the tongue, it's the lingual papillae. <clears throat> so these are just simply those knobs or protrusions, the lingual papillae. And we have four different types of papillae. So lingual papillae is the general term, and then there are four specific types. The first is the filiform papillae. And the filiform papillae, these are protrusions that are not associated with the taste. There's no taste buds that are going to be present. Rather than sensing taste, the filiform papillae are actually going to sense. They still have a sensory role, but it's a sense food texture, which I'm sure you're all very well aware that taste is not adequate alone, right? We love to smell our food, and we love food that has some sort of texture. Baby food is not good because it doesn't smell good, and it doesn't have really good texture. It's just really kind of bland and squishy. <laughs> So that texture is going to be picked up by these filiform papillae. Another set of papillae are the foliate papillae. These are located on the side of the tongue. So I'm located on the side of the tongue. They are associated with taste. So there's going to be taste buds that are going to be present, but primarily in infants and toddlers. So these are the taste buds of infants and toddlers. And at about three years of age, It'll degenerate. Which explains to a certain degree why babies and toddlers are okay with baby food. You eat a baby food as an adult, which I think you should. If you have kids, I think you should try baby food. And you're like, oh, but your kids, I mean, they just like, eat that up. Right? And it's because the taste buds that we have between us as adults and our infant and toddler is very much different.
The next papillae are going to be the fungiform papillae. These are located at the tip of the tongue, as you can see here. So towards the tip, uh, and even some on the sides as well. Within these taste buds, or uh, I'm sorry, papillae, we have approximately three taste buds that are going to be located per each protrusion, each fungiform papillae protrusion. Um, and these are going to persist throughout your lifetime. The last set of papillae are the valley papillae. These are located towards the back of the tongue. Okay, so located towards the back of the tongue. Now, there are a low number of the valley papillae. There's, there's just not a high number of them. However, these are extremely important in the sense of taste because even though they're low in number, they're very high in concentration of taste buds. So we have just a handful of the valley papilliform, I'm sorry, the valley um, papillae but many, many taste buds in each of those individual papillae, so very important in taste. Okay, so these protrusions, some hold sensory information or sensory receptors for texture, some of them hold um, taste buds. It's going to be the taste bud that's going to act as the sensor, so when you have food and the chemicals that are mixed in that food, they interact with those uh, taste buds. They're going to result in the production of chemical of, of uh, extra potentials sent into the nervous system to generate this sense of taste. Which, by the way, your sense of taste is just simply going to be a movie your mind plays for you, right? Taste is not anything more than just a representation of what should be happening in your mind. Taste is not something, it's just a chemical reaction occurring inside. Which we've already talked extensively about that last semester. You remember the conversation on the tree falls in the forest, does it really make the sound? You know that conversation? And I convinced you that it does not. <laughs> Taste buds are doing. It's still so weird. Yeah. Okay. Taste buds are the same thing. You get chemical information from the food that you eat. That sends an action potential, a nervous signal into the brain, and the brain creates what it should taste and gives you that sensation. All right, so let's take a look at some taste buds in more detail. So like I said, this arrow, boom, here it is. Micrograph and then a cartoon of an individual taste bud. Taste buds are all pretty much identical. They contain three individual types of cells. These three cells are going to be the taste or the gustatory cell. So you can see our gustatory cells here. These are kind of crescent shaped cells inside of the taste bud. On the tip of the membrane, they have these things called gustatory hairs, and we'll come back to those shortly. We're also going to have support cells that will help to maintain the uh, taste bud, and then we have basal cells. And these basal cells, they're a 
Well, all of them really are a type of ep epithelial cell, as you can see here. The basal cell is uh, the cell that's towards the base of the taste bud, near where the taste bud interacts with a cranial nerve. Now, it's going to be the gustatory cell that's going to be responsible for taking the chemical information from your food and converting it into an action potential to deliver it up to the brain so the brain can create taste for it. At the very tip here, you can see, so this is basically other cells within the tongue. Here's our taste bud, gustatory cells. At the tip of the gustatory cell, it, this thing called the taste pore, opening within the lingual epithelium, so food particles can make their way into here. We have these small little things called gustatory hairs. They're actually microvilli. So microvilli, we're going to call those taste hairs. So microvilli, again, that is a projection of cell membrane. They project into the opening called the taste pore. And basically, this is going to be an opening to allow interface with the environment of the oral cap. Invite that hamburger, begin to chew it, chemicals are being homogenized, released, broken up. Some of those chemicals are now going to interact with these microvilli through that taste pore. Now, each of these gustatory fibers, or I'm sorry, gustatory cells at the basal side where we have our connective tissue, these are going to interface with nerve fibers. Okay, so each cell, gustatory cell, has a nerve fiber. What we're going to see is there's a synapse between the gustatory cell and that nerve fiber, creating a presynaptic and a postsynaptic cell. The presynaptic cell is going to be the gustatory cell. The postsynaptic cell is going to be the neuron. I have a synapse. I'm going to need to release neurotransmitters. So those gustatory cells have the capability to release neurotransmitters to activate their networked nerve fiber. Now, I've already told you that basically, regardless of location, the taste bud is, is basically identical. All of your taste buds are pretty much the same, right? But you can taste hundreds of thousands of different flavors. If you couldn't, then you might as well just spend your whole life eating one type of food because it's all going to taste the same. But vanilla ice cream tastes one way. Chocolate ice cream tastes another way. Mint ice cream tastes another way. That's all you need to know. All the foods are irrelevant in the ice cream. <laughs> so how does that work? How do we get taste from a sensor that's identical to create hundreds of thousands of different ways that we can sense taste. Well, when you taste, it's coming from those molecules that are incorporated in the food. Okay, so what you probably have tried already in your life, and maybe you haven't, but you should, you need to chew in order to taste, right? Go to the calf, take a blueberry or a grape, pop that bad boy in your mouth and just swallow it. And you really don't taste anything, right? But you take that blueberry that is grape, pop it in your mouth, and you chew it up, and you get the flavor of grape, or you get the flavor of blueberry. The reason is, is because as you're breaking it up, as you're chewing it, you're, you're homogenizing the tissue, you're releasing molecules. And those molecules are now interacting through the taste board with those gustatory cells. Those molecules that are being produced as you chew your food
those molecules interact with those gustatory, gustatory hairs or taste hairs in different ways. Okay? In the way they interact, a lot of times it's through the functional groups that are present on those molecules or the types of uh, molecular bonds that are found in the molecule. It's going to stimulate release of neurotransmitters and the neurotransmitter is going to result in sending signal from many different gustatory cells into the central nervous system. All that information is going to be processed. Okay, these are the signals coming in from these gustatory cells. These are the signals coming in from here. Oh, this is a blueberry. And then your mind creates the flavor of the blueberry, what you should expect in a blueberry to taste. Okay, so most of these molecules interact in different ways and they lead to the release of neurotransmitter. There's one exception here that we need to know. Salt and other ions, you know, they become protonated or they lack the proton in a solution. So you can put some salt on your fries and you can eat that and you get that salt flavor. The salt itself, which becomes positive charged sodium, negatively char charged chloride, sodium, ends up, it's an ion, it ends up being able to cause action potentials direct. It doesn't have to interact through the gustatory cells. You get concentrational increases of sodium in that tissue, causing action potential to be generated directly. So action potentials can be created directly by our ions. Now, microvilli, what are microvilli for? Just in general terms, not necessarily in reference to the gustatory cells. Whenever we see microvilli, what are we doing in the cell membrane? We are increasing its surface area. In the membrane that makes up the microvilli, we have different types of receptors. Ions can create action potentials on their own. Other molecules that cannot create action potentials on their own, on their own are going to bind receptors in the microvilli of the gustatory cells. And those receptors are now going to be responsible to generate those unique composition of neurotransmitters bringing signals into the central nervous system. So that signal comes in and we've already detailed that pathway and basically how that's going to happen. You're going to have an action potential that ends up someplace in the central nervous system. The central nervous system is going to take that information and it's going to compare it to what it should expect. Oh, this is a signal from a blueberry. And really it's a signal from the chemicals that we find in the blueberry that give the blueberry its unique flavor. By the way, you've all probably had bland fruit before. And you're just like, oh, that fruit just didn't taste very good. Why did it probably not taste very good? Versus a piece of fruit, you're like, whoa, it's amazing. Okay, so probably the bland fruit has a lower concentration of those chemicals that are sending signals, and so you get less of the signal sent into the central nervous system. All right, so we've talked about pain. We've talked briefly about taste or gustation. Now I want to talk finally here on vision. Now for vision, what we're going to need to start out with is an anatomy of the eye. All right, 
the anatomy of the eye. Basically, this is going to be our sensory organ that can help us to process the information of, that comes from, from photons of light. So the eye itself consists of three components. Those three components are going to be the tunica, the optics, and the neural circuit. Tunica, hopefully you're recognizing that as layers. The optics is going to be basically how we convert a photon of light into a signal. And then the neural circuit is going to be how that chemical signal that's produced by the photon of light is uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, how that light energy uh, is converted into an electrical signal and how it's carried. So we're going to start out with the layers or the tunica. There are three layers that I'd like you to know about. The first is tunica fibrosa. And tunica fibrosa, what we're going to find out is what is um, the sclera, which is the whites of the eyes, and then the cornea, which is sort of that clear material over the eye. So the sclera and the cornea make up tunica fibrosa. The next is going to be tunica vasculosa. So this is going to be vasculature. So a layer where we're going to have a lot of blood supply. This we have uh, the choroid. This is a pigmented vascular tissue. We're going to have the ciliary body. which is going to be our muscular tissue. That is responsible to hold the iris and the lens. That ciliary body is also going to, um, sorry, it's going to produce aqueous humor. And then the third component here of the tunica vasculosa is going to be the iris itself, which is going to be an adjustable diaphragm. So we have this first outer layer here. sclera, and then also um, uh, the cornea. Okay. Then we have the second layer that's very much more vascular. We're going to have the choroid. It's going to come around, and then we're also going to have uh, the muscular tissue, the ciliary bodies, that are holding in the lens itself, and then also the iris, this pigmented portion of the eye. The iris, which is this opening here, or what creates the opening and, and is really what is responsible for the color of your eyes, this is an adjustable diaphragm. You've all seen the, the pupil here, that darker spot. It 
bigger than smaller, right? You've all seen that before. So this muscular tissue here, it can adjust. And as we're adjusting that size, it's like an aperture in photography. It adjusts the amount of light, how many photons can enter into the eye itself. Okay, so it's an adjustable diaphragm. Again, the center here, the central opening of the iris. It's called the pupil. And it is going to be our eye color. Anyone happen to know how we get our eye color, what molecule is responsible for generating your eye color? Same thing that gives you your tan. It's going to be melanin. It's going to be pigments. Now, the cells that generate the melanin to give us our eye color, again, that we find here in the iris, embedded within the iris are cell types called chromatophores. Color cells is literally what a chromatophore is. So those are going to be the producers of that melanin to give us our eye color. All right, now you can see that the very inside, this kind of yellowish layer here, that's our third layer. Since it is the inside, we're going to call it the tunica interna. It encases an open cavity. It's called the vitreous body. But that interna, the tunica interna, is, is what contains tissue called the retina. And also infolds here into the cavity or the, the channel that's going to contain the optic nerve. Okay, so we got those three layers. And it results in this open cavity. And in fact, there's going to be two cavities, right? You're going to have your anterior chamber and then your posterior chamber or the vitreous body. Uh, and this vitreous body here, all along the wall of the vitreous body where we have our retina, is where we're actually going to begin to see the optics, how we convert photons of light into information that can be interpreted by the nervous system. Okay, so optics. This is a general term. You probably have run into optics before. It's what um, we use to describe the use of a microscope. You maybe have run, run into it before if you've taken a physics or a physical science class. Optics are just simply materials that bend or refract light. Now, I'm sure you've all put a pencil into water before, and as it breaks that surface, it looks like the pencil's bending. And that's because the optical properties of the air versus the water are going to be slightly different. The way they bend or reflect light is slightly different. The optics of the eye should result where light is focused onto the retina. So light is going to enter the eye, and you can see that initially it goes through the cornea. And then through this thing called the aqueous humor. And then we end up going through the lens. And then through the vitreous body, or the vitreous humor. OK, now, each step along the way, the system I just gave you, air, to water. 
life refracted there. In this system from cornea, so really it's from the external environment through the cornea, through the aqueous humor, through the lens, through the vitreous body, all along the way, bending the light in a little bit different way. To hopefully land light onto the retina so that information can be picked up and processed. So this solution called the aqueous humor is what fills the anterior and posterior chambers. So we have this front portion here just below the cornea before we go through the lens. That's called the anterior chamber. And then we have this posterior chamber, which is back by the lens. And we have aqueous humor that fills up both of those chambers. Then we have the lens. The lens itself is actually flattened cells. It's comprised of flattened cells that we refer to as lens fibers. So this term here, lens fiber, this is just simply refer, referring to the flattened cells that are going to make up and produce the lens. You can see that this lens it is going to be suspended by ligaments called suspensory ligaments. So basically the lens is going to be held in place by these ligaments. And then behind the lens, we end up in the vitreous body. And that vitreous body is going to also be filled with humor, with a solution. The vitreous body is what fills up this thing called the vitreous chamber here and then leads into this thing called the optic canal. Now, You know what, let me back up. I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself just a little bit. I apologize. There's a canal, and it's actually not shown in here, but if you look at the eye, within that chamber, there's this, there's this canal that's found within the vitreous body. It's from the hyaloid artery. which is going to be a artery from the embryonic stage of the individual. Is everybody good? All right, so um, really last thing that we want to talk about here, we have the layers. We now understand how the light's refracted, and it's being focused on the retina, which is part of the neural circuit, which is our last anatomical unit of the eye, which is where photons of light, light energy is converted into an electrical signal that gets trapped passing in the brain for the brain to interpret what you're, what you're seeing. Okay. 
Okay, so the neural circuit is going to be comprised of the optic nerve and the retina. Now, this tissue that's called the retina, I want to actually bring this out. Um, so, this is this is the retina itself, and you can see it's comprised of a bunch of different types of cells, multiple layers in this tissue known as the retina. The very back layer, the back layer of cells are going to make up a pigmented membrane. That pigmented membrane, pigments are molecules that absorb light. And so this pigmented membrane is going to actually absorb any stray light. So you don't have a bunch of light bouncing around in there. It's going to be absorbed um, to, to remove the effect. The next layer of tissue are going to be, or the next layer of cells, I guess I should say, are going to be photo receptors. So the photoreceptors, these are the parts of uh, anatomy that you're probably most familiar with. These are the rods and the cones, which I'm sure you've heard of those terms before. Okay, so photoreceptors, rods and cones. Rods and cones are bipolar cells. And they also are going to be associated with ganglion cells, nervous system cells. Okay? So we have the rod and then the bipolar cell and then the ganglion leading out to the optic nerve. And then here's our pigmented layer. This is to absorb that stray light. Rods are going to be cells that contain a molecule called rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is another pigment. Molecules of rhodopsin consist of two chemical parts. These two parts are going to be opsin and retinol. Okay? So the cell called a rod contains rhodopsin. Rhodopsin consists of opsin, and this, this is supposed to be an R. That's supposed to say retinol. So those two chemicals, they have the capability to respond to photo energy, energy contained within light. Okay, so retinol actually can go through a photoisomerization reaction. So retinol, when it is uh, interacted with light, it undergoes isomerization. And this isomerization by light leads towards the production of action potentials. So we have an increase in the number of action potentials that are going to be produced when retinol is isomerized. So in the presence of light, retinol takes on a new shape. When it takes on that new shape, it increases the action potentials that are being sent down the optic nerve. You close your eyes or it becomes dark. 
and that isomerization is no longer maintained by that light energy, and so it reverts back to the other isomer. So we lift the light signal, i.e. in the dark, and this decreases the action potential, the rate of action potential. Now, the information that comes with rhodopsin, notice that it's lots of light or no light. Rods see the difference in light and no light on a gray scale. So this isn't color vision. This is basically, is it bright out or is it dark out or in some place in between? Okay, so those rods are going to differentiate on a gray scale. It becomes more gray because of the reduction in action potentials because of less light. It becomes less gray, more white, when we have more light and more action potential, or more frequency of action potentials. Okay, so that's one part of the rhodopsin molecule. I'm sorry, that's one part of the um, of the retina is basically the grayscale component. So we have information constantly coming in in how dark or how bright it is. And really we're changing the action potential frequency to determine if it's lighter or if it's dark. So if I return off all the lights right now, action potential is dropping. If I turn all of them back on, action potential is now increasing. And so you're responding in your brain to say, oh, okay, it's brighter now. So I'm going to create this vision sense where the surroundings are much brighter. Cones, the other part of the system here. Rods contain rhodopsin. Cones contain photopsin. Um, this was actually the rhodopsin molecule. Probably would have been beneficial if I had brought this up when we were talking about rods. But anyway, um, so this is this is the rod cell. Let's just step back real quick. Pretend like that didn't happen. So this is the rod cell, and you can see that you have these discs. This is basically a membrane that contains rhodopsin. And so if we zoom in on that membrane, here's our rhodopsin molecule containing retinol and opsin. Okay. Notice it's a conformational change. Whenever we have a conformational change, the membrane change, or there's a change in the membrane's permeability, and it creates differential action potentials, or different action potentials. Okay? So just like what you said, first thing you said to, in this class, if you change a protein shape, you change its function. The way we're changing this protein shape is by increasing or decreasing the presence of light, how much light energy is coming in. Cones contain this molecule called photopsin. And just like with rhodopsin, photopsin is going to consist of two parts as well. A different form of opsin, but then the same retinol molecule is what we found in the rods. What do you think we're going to get at with the cones? Rods are for the brightness. Cones are going to be for color. So it's going to be optimal if we can differentiate groups of colors along that visible spectrum. I'm telling you that there's different options. What we're actually going to find out is there are three different types of options that associate with photops in, in the cones. Let's 
So three kinds. And the kinds, the three different kinds, they are grouped or categorized or differentiated based on the color wavelength they best respond to. Okay, so now we're talking about that physics characteristic of light. Light, visible light is between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. 700 nanometers is what we see as red light, 400 is what we would see as violet. So three different kinds based on the color wavelength that the opsin molecule best responds to. Those opsins are going to have different structures, which shouldn't, shouldn't surprise you, right? Because we have the different abilities to respond, so the different functions are going to follow different forms. And so what we're going to find inside of the photopsin molecule, the three different types of opsin, you're going to have shortwave opsin, which has a peak right around 420 nanometers. What kind of light would that be? Violet. Medium wave, that's supposed to be wave A, B, E. Medium wave, it's going to have a peak right around 531 nanometers. So this is right around that green color. And then we have long wave, which peaks right around 558 nanometers, which is more along the lines of yellow, orange. Okay, so these three different options, you have light comes in and interacts with the rod, and it's dictating how bright or how light that information is sent to the brain. The brain processes that information and says it's really bright out and creates a scene that has bright light. Or it's really dark out, creates a scene that has really dark light. And then you have information coming in from these three different options. Here's the amount of violet type light that's coming in. Here's the type or the amount of green light. Here's the amount of red orange light coming in. And it takes all that information and it creates for you basically a movie in your mind about what your surroundings should look like. So your brain integrates all of these different color signals and the brightness signal from the rods to produce an image. <laughs> 